Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I hope you're grabbing uh, another cup of coffee, um, thinking about what you're going to have for lunch. That's always fun and what I like to do. Um, we're so excited to have you with us um, on this Bird Friendly Text in the webinar. Um, as folks are hopping in, uh, we'll just give a little bit of time for that to happen. Uh, feel free to go into, uh, unfortunately, our chat is disabled, but if you want to go in the Q&A, you're welcome to tell us where you're joining us in from. I'd love to always hear um, who is on, on our webinar with us um, and give us a sense of space. Um, a, uh, if I haven't had an opportunity to meet you before, my name is Chloe Crumley. I'm our engagement manager um, with our state office. Um, and I'm so excited to have us go through these bird-friendly text and webinars. Uh, the goal are these is to really connect with our community, share with some of the programming that we're doing, and talk about how we can all be a little bit of a um, bird, better birder or bird-friendly Texan um, in our community and spaces. So today we have a really special webinar um, with our wonderful presenters and our moderator, who's going to talk to us about what an Audubon Center is, Talk to us about our three Audubon centers here in Texas, if you didn't know that we had them, uh, and to share a little bit about how you can be an Audubon um, steward and use our Audubon centers as a resource. We have a great thing at the very end we're gonna launch. Um, it's called our Audubon Texas Steward Program. And um, we're asking folks to get engaged with that at the end, and we'll show you what that looks like exactly. Um, but throughout this, you'll be able to hear about ways that you can be really a conservation steward in your community and we're going to ask how you can share that um, a larger, larger, largely um, through some social media content. Um, what I want to do, though, now we have some folks in joining us. We have some people from Brownsville. Love having Brownsville. Love having Central Texas. Um, hey, Kate, good to see you in Austin. I'm in Austin, too. Love um, Conroe. We have lots of folks coming in. Um, good to see another chapter coming in, Furry and Timbers. Um, nice to have you here, Merrick. So love having com people coming in. Feel free to throw that in the Q&A. Um, nice to see your people are joining us in from. And thank you for coming back if you've been to one of these webinars before. Um, nice to see those familiar people. We want to also get a sense of if you've ever been to an Audubon Center. So what I'm going to do is start a poll. Um, and it's going to help us understand um, who is connected with our Audubon Centers and if you haven't been there before. Um, so we've got to know. So we're gonna talk more about all these centers, um, but if you see on your screen, you should have a poll that's popped up. Um, and we'd love to hear if you don't mind answering. If this is your first time learning about that we have Audubon centers here um, in Texas, um, if you've been to an Audubon center, go through and click which ones you've been to. Um, even if you haven't been to one in Texas, if you've been one in the US, um, that's an option too at the very bottom. We'd love to see kind of what that looks like. Oh, okay, we got a lot of answers coming in. Um, going back and forth. So we know that it looks like some people already know that it almost tied space and people know that there are Audubon centers. Um, now we're getting an option to say like, it looks like we have a almost majority of us. Oh, interesting. So we know that people have been to an Audubon center in the US but it looks like a lot of us have not yet been to one of our Audubon centers here in Texas. That's really exciting for us to talk about them for you all. Um, Julie is uh, correcting me earlier on our emails. We talked about there are 41 centers and we technically have 31 centers. Um, but we also have other sanctuaries and sites that are included in Audubon, but today we're gonna specifically be talking about those centers. And so I'm so excited to see those that are in the room. I'm excited to hear that if you have not had a chance to get to our center, what it's gonna look like for you today. Um, if you have questions as we go along, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Again, our chat is disabled, but Q&A, we can access that easily. Um, and I'm gonna pass it off to Yvette Stewart. She's gonna be our moderator for today. Um, Yvette is a wonderful educator with Audubon. She runs amazing programs, and I'm so excited for her to have us talk have us run this panel for us um, and have her expertise shared. So I'm gonna let Yvette introduce herself um, and she'll tell you about her, also her bird friend. I'd love her to share. And so without further ado, Yvette, how about you kick us off? Hello and welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us to hear about our delightful centers. We're excited to share 
our conservation passions with you and what actions you can take at home, even if you don't get to visit a center. And so as Chloe said, I am the Community Outreach Coordinator for Audubon, Texas, which means I run an awesome high school program and do other sorts of engagement with the public. And sitting here on my shoulder, you can't quite see, let's see if we can get her. There's my bird green leaf. So hopefully she'll be quiet throughout this, but if you hear some squeaking, it's because we are very bird friendly here and she likes to be in the meetings. So um, I have a degree in wildlife and conservation biology, and that's where my passion for birds started. But I also did AmeriCorps and was an educator. And so that's where my passion for education comes from. So that's a little bit of my background. And I'm going to have each center introduce themselves instead of me giving all the details about these lovely people and places. And so first, I'm going to kick it over to Julie. And Julie, as you introduce yourself, can you tell us where your center is, not just what's great about it? Great. Good morning, I'm Julie Collins. I'm the director of Dogwood Canyon Audubon Center and it is in Cedar Hill, which is in Dallas County. So I am involved in things like talking with partners, collaborating with staff and stake stakeholders, researching conservation data, working with volunteers, but really I love our forest. And so the most fun that I have is taking the time out to look at our peaceful forest, but also to greet our visitors hear their stories of why they're there, and for me to be able to talk about Dogwood Canyon. And that's what I look forward to on a day-to-day -day basis. Dogwood is a very special place, and we should say that it's free to visit. So for anybody who needs some time out in the woods and you're in the Cedar Hill area or greater Dallas area, hop on over to Dogwood. Um, we're gonna switch next to Mitchell Lake. And so Erin, would you come in and introduce us to Mitchell Lake and yourselves and tell us a little bit about where you are. Hi everyone, my name is Erin McGurl and I'm the Senior Coordinator of Education at Mitchell Lake Audubon Center. We are in South San Antonio, Texas at the convergence of four different Texas ecoregions. Um, in my daily role, I coordinate and run school field trips um, anywhere from second grade all the way up to high school. Uh, so I usually have a flock of people behind me and um, the groups come out and they learn about birds and our wetlands and different habitats and their importance. And um, we also have community programs for kids and families such as owl prowls and Moth Night, I run those. And we have adult programs and workshops. And so I have the fun job of telling people how awesome this place is and showing them all the cool wildlife and plants that benefit from it. Um, and that's what I love most about my job is showing all those little details and everyone getting excited about, about this place. I have a special love for Mitchell Lake because that's where I started my journey with Audubon, Texas. And there are seven miles of trails there. So you guys can drive, you can walk like Erin said, there's so many beautiful habitats. It's a really fantastic place to visit. Last but not least, we're gonna bounce back up to the Dallas area and talk about Jake and Trinity River. Jake, would you introduce yourself? Sure, hello everybody. My name is Jake Poinsett. I'm the program manager at the Trinity River Audubon Center in South Dallas. And my work revolves around the world of environmental education and boots on the ground conservation. So we offer academic programs for students from kindergarten to college, as well as a variety of public programs for people of all ages and experience levels. Um, what really excites me about what we do at Audubon is that we get to incorporate our boots on the ground conservation with our programming. So we can have others um, understand the importance of restoring and protecting these habitats and be that bridge to have others build their own relationships with nature. Um, let them know that these places are super important, not just for wildlife, but for people alike too. The Trinity River and Mitchell Lake have this robust history of a place that was centered in the community, but was not taken care of. We have histories of um, dumping at Trinity River. It was a landfill that was reclaimed by the city. Mitchell Lake was a sewage, raw sewage dump area for 60-ish years in the early 1900s. And things have changed dramatically, and we are really doing a lot to steward the land at each of our centers now. And so I want to take a moment to hear from each center, you know, why is your center important to the community in this day and age? And what should new visitors know about your area? And I'm going to start with my close to heart Mitchell Lake area. So Erin, would you take it away? Yes. So, um, 
We are important to the community because we are located on the south side of San Antonio and with a major metro metropolitan area, we've got the hustle and bustle of the city. It's great to have a place to recharge and center yourself and relax and just get connected to nature. Um, when people are connected to nature, that's when they want to protect it. So we offer that without really going too far from the city. We're right here. Um, new people coming to the center. Uh, I One of the coolest things to me about Mitchell Lake Audubon Center is the fact that we were, like you mentioned, um, an early, we were the early sewage site for San Antonio. Um, but because of people advocating for this place and knowing that birds were coming in, um, their work to protect it. Um, now it is for the birds, literally. It's 1200 acres and about 600 of it is the lake and the rest are our different habitats. Um, we've got scrublands, wetlands, grasslands, and woodlands. And um, because of those different habitats and our location on the central flyway, we get over 300 50 different bird species annually that come through. So great place for birding, um, but it's also a great place to walk and enjoy nature. And an also really unique feature is that we have driving trails. So if you don't wanna get out of your car, you just wanna enjoy nature from your car, you can drive along the wetlands and see everything to see there, which is especially nice uh, with this heat. And it's very welcoming to people with mobile disabilities, right? If you are able to drive or have someone drive you, you can see incredible wildlife around Mitchell Lake. Awesome. Um, Jake, I'm going to jump it to you next. What's going on at Trinity River? Sure. Um, you know, we're important for our community for a slew of reasons, but like Yvette mentioned, um, Trinity River Audubon Center, where we're located, used to be the largest illegal dump site in Texas history. If you took all the trash that was dumped here illegally and stacked it up, it would be taller than the Empire State Building. It's a lot of trash. Um, the local community said enough is enough. We're sick and tired of being the trash can. So uh, because of them, we are here. And now we are a beautiful biodiverse wildlife refuge with many different plants and animals that um, depend on the various habitats that we have on site from grasslands to wetlands to our beautiful Great Trinity Forest. So we're located in the largest urban bottomland hardwood forest in the country at 6,000 acres. Um, right here in Dallas, pretty special. And we offer a variety of programs for people to come out and experience and take these guided exploration trips through nature. But also you can come out and explore on your own. So we have a lot of first time visitors that uh, come out to the center and we often get the question, what should we do first? We do have five miles of trail, uh, but I always recommend checking out our river trail because that's our namesake, the Trinity River. And it's a beautiful overlook and it really is the lifeblood for the city of Dallas. So it's a very, very important place. And we are free for general admission. Um, and it's exciting that because we've been free moving forward, our visitation numbers have gone up considerably. So we invite everybody to come out and explore and uh, fall in love with the wild side of Dallas. I should have asked Erin, and I'm going to ask you, Jake, and then give it back to Erin. What are your hours? When should people be visiting? Sure. So we are open to the general public um, Wednesday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. and Saturdays, 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. We also offer early morning bird walks that are um, that begin before regular operating hours for anyone who wants to get up and you know early bird gets the worm or early birder gets the bird. And we also offer night programs that are after hours. So it all depends. Erin? Our hours are, we're open Tuesday through Sunday. Um, right now for fall hours, um, seven to noon on Tuesday through Thursday and um, seven to two on Friday through Sunday. And um, those will change after we, uh, so those are summer hours, excuse me, and those will change in the fall to be open a little bit earlier with the time, with the daylight change. And those hours will be posted on all of our centers. And not to be remiss, we don't want to miss what's happening at Dogwood and why Dogwood is important to our communities. Julie, will you give people um, information about when they should visit Dogwood as well? Sure. So we, just to get the hours done, uh, we are open Wednesday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we are, for our community, we're a gateway for families and others new to hiking, as we're a safe, comfortable place for people to explore a natural space. 
So in addition to being mission free, we offer the opportunity for people to learn about local birds here and our ecosystem and why it's important to protect these wild spaces. So in addition to the birds, of course, but we've it's a full intact ecosystem and it has the, the bobcats, coyotes, armadillos, foxes. It's we've basically got all the typical mammals here. New visitors should know that we are, have about three miles of trails. We do conduct bird walks and plant walks and other programs. We have a wonderful gift shop, a children's natural play area, as well as an indoor bird feeder viewing area, and of course, opportunities to volunteer here and help our center. One thing that's really wonderful about Dogwood is it's right down the hill from the Cedar Hill State Park. And so if people are passionate about state parks, don't forget there are other incredible nature centers right next door. And we would encourage people to hit both places as you are on your uh, nature walks or your time outside. And Julie, you hit upon some really important aspects that's gonna lead into our next question, which is protecting ecosystems and the places that birds need. And so actually, Jake, I'm gonna jump over to you first. And can you tell us a little bit about how your center, how Trinity is working to protect birds and the places they need today and tomorrow? Sure. Um, it's something that we're all very passionate about. We're all big bird nerds here at, at TRAC, and um, we do so um, through education, conservation action, and through advocacy. So for education, we are working to foster that next generation of environmental stewards. And also, like I mentioned before, be the bridge for others to build their own relationships with nature through a variety of programs and activities. Um, you don't have to go far, far away to marvel at the wonders of ecology. You can do it right here in Dallas. Um, and for conservation, we are actively restoring the critically imperiled grassland plant communities here in our Blackland Prairie ecosystem. So that's important for our grassland dependent birds and other organisms that are associated with these plant communities, because a lot of them are in steady decline, unfortunately. So this is still a safe haven for so many different organisms and a green space where people can learn about it. And then through advocacy, it's exciting that uh, Dallas is a bird city. And we're letting people know that these places are important. We're sharing this ecosystem with them. So we're a big part of our Bird City team through Lights Out Texas. We try to encourage people to turn their lights out at night to give safe passage for migrating birds. We're just trying to be the voice for birds in, in every way possible. Thank you so much for bringing up the Bird City Texas program. For folks who are interested, um, Chloe is leading the charge on that and what that looks like. We now have 10 communities across the state. And so Chloe, if you could put the website into the chat, that'd be wonderful. And Jake, I'm gonna just brag a little bit about the work that Trinity is doing because you folks hosted the Audubon Conservation Leader intern this past year, uh, past summer, and Jackie did an incredible job helping to restore what she called a pocket, sorry, a pocket prairie. And I'm gonna put the link to her um, blog piece into the chat as well. So if people are interested about how they can take on some of these actions at home, it's a great resource. I believe you're on mute. That there we go. Sorry, I muted myself by accident. Uh, can we hear from Mitchell Lake? What are you guys doing to help protect birds? So with city development um, all around us, um, just being that 1,200 acre space for birds is um, is protecting them by. Uh, since habitat loss is such a big issue. But we have a lot of other variety of conservation efforts in place. Um, of course, our education programs, which is my favorite way of, of conservation, because as cliche, as cliche as it sounds, young people really are the future. And when they care, um, it's really cool to see and get them involved. Um, our grassland restoration was a big project that we just um, completed a phase on. Uh, where our grassland area was overtaken with invasive Bermuda grass, which invasive grass is everywhere. Um, we worked with, we partnered with Native American Seed Company to remove that, and they planted it with native grasses. Um, so we're excited to see that come up, and I think it'll really benefit our grassland species that we have migrating through. And then we also have turkey and quail on property, um, which are grassland species. So um, we're excited to see what it does for those. We also have native plant gardens around our house, um, which attract a lot of native birds, but it's also set up as a demonstration area so that people can see um, what they can do in their own yards. And we have lots of different workshops available. Um, and 
invasive invasive species removal efforts and habitat work days that people can get involved with if if they want to. Mitchell Lake also has incredible shorebird habitat, depending on what levels of water are in the polders and in the lake at the back of the property. And so that fluctuates depending on our rain that we get throughout the year. And then also San Antonio water system that kind of helps mitigate how much water is in there. And I bring that up because it's the beginning of fall migration. And so shorebirds are often the first to take off into the sky. And so Mitchell Lake offers this wonderful resting spot for a lot of those species as well. Um, great, thank you so much, Erin, for highlighting the wonderful grassland conservation. Again, those grassland species are stressed and declining in a lot of places. So it's great that we have a center that's working toward that. Julie, last but not least, what are some of the activities that um, Dogwood is doing? And maybe you could tell us about a special warbler that's been on your property. Absolutely. So we have about 200 acres of a mixed hardwood juniper forest. It's an east meets west eco regions that uh, come together. And our habitat is home to about 100 species of birds, both migrating and resident. And so we are doing bird surveys right now to, for some target species that include summer tanagers, Louisiana water thrush, black and white warblers, painted buntings. Um, we also do the CBC here in Cedar Hill and other surveys. But what we're really have been excited about in recent years, so when this land was first protected back in the 90s, the golden cheek warbler was seen here. Now, this is an endangered species that breeds only in Texas. And it, for some reason, it disappeared for about 20 years from this habitat. However, the last couple of years, we have seen it reappear. We don't know why, but we're excited that that bird is here and so what resonates with me is that it shows that we have the habitat for this bird as well as other birds. And so we are ready for them whenever these birds need this habitat. Thank you all for kind of sharing the different activities we are doing at all of our centers to help birds thrive, especially in our changing world. Birds and people are deeply connected and so I want to turn the conversation to the broader picture, both in our centers and in the communities outside of our centers. What do each of you think your community is doing well in conservation? And where's a growing edge? Where's something that they can improve upon? And so, Julie, I want to actually start off with you again, if you wouldn't mind kind of giving us some input. Well, um, in addition to being designated a bird city, Cedar Hill has the goal to have at least 25% of their land mass as green space, which is huge. That is more than most cities ever strive for. And Dogwood Canyon is part of that goal. So, but in addition to all the parks and the trails the city creates and is getting all of those spaces connected within the city, uh, Dogwood Canyon is considered a gem within the city, and so we are the only staffed green space in Cedar Hill that focuses on birds, conservation, and education. So one thing that we try to help uh, the city do, and as, as well as any uh, local community, is that let them know that conservation can happen anywhere. And so, yes, large swath, swaths of land are being protected and that's great, but conservation can happen right at home. So planting native plants is probably one of the best things that you can do to help wildlife at home. It's all about food, water, and shelter. And if everyone converted their landscapes to native habitats, we would have a lot of connected dots within our urban areas that would benefit birds. Yes, every little bit of native plants is truly helpful for not just the birds, but their food sources like insects, um, the larger animals that want to hunt birds, all of that. Thank you so much for the work you're doing there. Erin, um, what about you? What are you San Antonio doing well? And what's something they should think about doing more of? So in South Texas, water conservation is a big issue. And I think our community does a really good job at promoting native and drought tolerant plants um, to conserve water. We just had two um, awesome partners and native, fully native nurseries open up in San Antonio area, the Nectar Bar 
and pollinatives. Um, they actually open tomorrow. So um, I think that we're doing great with promoting natives. So many um, organizations around town um, help with that. Um, I think one thing that people could be more aware of is um, along with while you're inviting those birds to your space with natives, um, the insects are part of that. Um, they offer food for birds. Not only are the native plants pollinator friendly with butterflies and, and hummingbirds, but the, the caterpillars that come on those are, are going to be great protein sausages for baby birds and um, it all that little life cycle that happens. We, we planted a passion vine in my yard and my kids got to see the awesome life cycle of the Gulf fritillary. Um, so that's all part of it. And while you're inviting those birds and insects to your space, there's other things in your yard that you can do to, to make it great too, such as um, since birds and since window strikes and cats are major sources of bird mortality, um, putting anti-collision tape on your windows or UV reflective dots in the correct way, and then um, bring adding a water feature, and then really importantly, keeping cats indoors. Beautifully said. I will forever love that sausage image for bird, baby birds. Great. <laughs> Thank you so much. Track, Trinity River, what is good in Dallas and where could Dallas improve on our conservation? Sure. I think here in South Dallas, we have a, a, a growing, a wonderful naturalist community where we're working to um, just expose to all walks of life the, the benefits of of protecting nature and all the different ways people can get involved. Um, we work with uh, local high schools and colleges where they can experience our service learning programs so they can um, learn more about prairie ecology, the different ecosystem functions of these habitats where we live, and they can get some experience in the field if they want to be uh, a career conservationist. So we do that with um, uh, bird banders where we get uh, we have multiple banding stations on site where they can see up close and personal a bird in hand, as well as helping uh, having students help grow plants on site. Where we can put them back into the ground. So these real life experiences are allowing them to uh, create new naturalists of, them, of themselves. And I think it's a, a theme here with native plants. I would love to see more native plants incorporated within our communities, maybe some places that are it will be available for purchase and more involved with landscaping because native plants really are the foundation for this ecosystem. They are what starts everything. And the benefits they provide are not just for birds and for wildlife, but for us too. So prairies are, are excellent examples of carbon sequestration. It helps us um, with clean air. It helps store water, it helps prevent flooding. And then all the riparian habitats that are, are surrounded, our river and local streams, all these native plants act like the sponge and the filter that we need. You had two really great points that I just wanna highlight, which is, Ecology, ecosystems need diversity. And that's not just diversity of plants or insects or birds, it's people too. Every person of every background belongs in our centers and we wanna call those people in. If you have never been to a center, if you feel nervous about walking around in nature, come to one of our beginning bird walks. We will help you feel safe. We'll help you understand the whys of how to identify stuff. Uh, we'll give you binoculars for the day. We really want people to explore and experience nature in a way that feels safe and welcoming to them. So thank you for highlighting that diversity call out. And then also everybody can do a plant. It doesn't matter if you don't have like deep soil, you can put a, a native plant in a pot on your balcony. If that's the kind of outdoor space you have and you can still help the world around us. And there's something really beautiful and relaxing about watching a plant grow and the dedicated um, actions that you have to kind of pursue in order to help that plant grow. It's a very symbiotic relationship. So thank you for highlighting both of those things. And you also mentioned water. And so I also mentioned water earlier. And fall, we hope to get more rain in Texas at this time of year. Um, water is a really important resource and it's important for migrating birds. And so I want to take a moment and kind of think about where we are in the life cycle of birds where they're starting to take off and head to their overwintering spots. So what are our centers doing well for migrating birds and where can people see them? Um, so I'm gonna head over to Mitchell Lake in my neck of the woods. And what is something, Erin, you want people to be aware of for fall migration? Yeah, so I've been really excited seeing all the colorful yellow warblers and blue gray net catchers around. Um, but shorebird season is 
right there with fall migration. So we actually have a, um, a shoreboard workshop coming up on September 9th. So if you're interested in seeing our different shorebirds, you can attend that um, or just come anytime around this time. Um, a lot of people don't think of shorebirds with San Antonio, but because we have wetlands, we get a lot of species that you would think of near the coast, um, but we have them here. Lots of um, sandpipers, and we also have American white pelicans. Big flocks of them come in around this time of year. And just this morning, we had a roseate spoonbill out on the lake. So um, fall is shorebird season. And then right around the corner, if you like ducks, we've got duck season coming up pretty soon too. Thanks so much. Jake, what's migrating in, in Trinity River? Sure. Um, all of our centers and all the preserved spaces in Texas, it's like the Bucky's for birds on migration, right? Like we all stop at Bucky's on a road trip to get, you know, food and fuel and relax. So it's fun and exciting to see what, what pops up during these critical times of their lives. So, so far for fall migration, we've had wood storks and roseate spoonbills hanging out in what's left of our ponds. Um, but even though a lot of the ponds are starting to dry up, these mud flats are still really important habitats for some of our shorebirds passing through. So today we've had leaf sandpipers and solitary sandpipers. Um, yesterday there was upland sandpipers that were flying around and probably utilizing some of the grassland areas around us. So it's really cool to see what's passing through. And then also with songbirds, we've had yellow warblers lately. But in a little bit, I'm really, really pumped about sparrow season. Some of my favorite birds are sparrows. And if you'd like to learn more about them and possibly see a bird in hand, we're going to have a Mosey banding station starting in November. And you can reach out to, to us at the Audubon Center here in Dallas to, to learn and observe. Mosey uh, refers to the Institute for Bird Populations. They do two different types of bird banding monitoring. One is in the summer, the breeding season, that's called MAPS, and it stands for Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. And then MOSI is actually in Spanish. If I said it in Spanish, I'd probably butcher it, so I'm not going to. But it basically stands for monitoring winter sites or site habitat. And so both of those are really important aspects of bird life cycle. How are they breeding? How many babies are being produced? Are the babies staying in the habitat? That's the summer. Winter is who's showing up? Who uses this habitat in winter? Are they getting fat before spring uh, migration? It's very interesting hands-on experience. So if anybody is interested in learning about bird banding, definitely check out um, track options there. The Trinity River Audubon. Sorry, I shouldn't use the acronym. Um, also, I wanna highlight that both in our San Antonio Center and in our Trinity River Center, we have MODIS towers. And so these are areas where if a bird is flying over our center during migration and they have been tagged during bird banding with a small transmitter, we can get these little pings of information about what birds are flying over and if they're staying in our habitat. So um, I'm, I don't wanna misspeak, but I believe that we've had common nighthawks at our centers. We've had an American kestrel in San Antonio. Maybe a whippoorwill might be the other one. Um, okay, great. And I'm gonna and put- Morning the warblers in, in the spring as well. We had a couple of morning warblers that were wintering at a bird-friendly coffee farm in Columbia. And they were just passing through Dallas and we happened to have them ping on our tower. Um, we've been watching every morning, every time we get in to see if anything popped up this, this fall migration, but nothing yet. Stay tuned. Hopefully we'll catch a bird on the tower or we'll get a ping on the tower. And I did just put in the link to the Trinity River Audubon Center tower. So folks who are saying that sounds really cool, I want to know more, head on over to the site there. And I don't want to skip over what's migrating through Dogwood. Um, Julie, I know you guys have a wonderful pocket prairie right in front of the center, which is the image of your background right now. Can you tell us a little bit about what's coming through Dogwood? Well, um, I don't think we've seen a lot yet, but it seems like once the monarchs start passing through, the monarch butterfly, is in, it's interesting as it comes starts coming through here in the fall and makes it their way to Mexico. Uh, that's when we know that the, the juncos, the dark-eyed juncos and some of the sparrows Will, and the goldfinches will also be not far behind. So that's what we look forward to seeing soon. Um, yes, our prairie is very small. Um, sorry, distracted by my window and tiger swallowtail butterfly just flew by. Uh, so our prairie is very small, but yet it has enough tall grasses for cover for the sparrows and the juncos and wildflowers from the season that are also providing seeds for food 
during the winter, goldfinches, I love seeing them feed on the giant sunflowers and the little dangling ornamental seed balls that are on our sycamore trees and just the fluff goes flying everywhere. But uh, so one of the activities that we do during winter migration is uh, having signing up for Project Feeder Watch. And because we have a nice observation place uh, for bird feeders at our center, we can watch from the indoors, but we can also see the ground feeders as well. And so we sign up for Project Feeder Watch and get ready to count the migrants coming through. And that's something that any, anyone can do. You can do it in your own yard, or if you don't have a place to count, you can come out to our center and help us count. Um, you just called out, you know, wonderful community science, and that is a really important aspect to understanding who's using our habitat, understanding how healthy our habitats are. And so another project that comes to mind is tagging monarchs. So you mentioned monarchs as kind of being the harbingers of who's going to be there in the fall migration and and uh, over winter with you. Tagging monarchs, if anybody here ends up seeing a monarch with a small sticker on its wing, that's not a throwaway sticker. It was put there on purpose because monitoring where the monarchs go and how they're migrating is really important uh, community science. And so I know that Texas master naturalists often do that. I know in the past we've done it at Mitchell Lake. Erin, I don't know if Mitchell Lake is still tagging monarchs. Not currently, but we have been talking about adding that into our community science repertoire again. Well, I would love to hear from folks, what are some of the opportunities for other people to get engaged? So we just mentioned Texas Master Naturalist a little bit. Each of our centers are really dependent on volunteers. And so maybe there's an opportunity to call out options, either volunteering with the Master Naturalist or at our centers. And uh, let's start over at Dogwood. What opportunities do you have? Uh, so there's there's always volunteering. So it's it's helping with our greeting with our visitors, helping them get guided to the trails, answering questions, or in our habitat. So removing invasive plants, helping in our gardens, um, just clearing trees within our prairie. Uh, there's a lot of corporate groups that come out, youth groups that come out to volunteer with us. Um, I think that that's primarily what, is that what you were looking for was the volunteer opportunities? I think Yvette is frozen. I think she might be frozen too. That's okay. I bet she'll be able to hop back on here in a second. Uh, yeah, I think that's, Julie, I think that's perfect. I think you're talking about ways people can get involved with what those look like. Um, and I'm actually going to use that as an opportunity to circle back into a question that we had from the audience um, asking about events. Um, so maybe if Jake, if you want to jump in on ways that you think people get, can get involved, um, but then also thinking about, is there an event coming up that you also want to highlight? You talked, you mentioned about a couple that are really interesting already, but I'm just curious, like, um, hanging an event is also a good way to get people connected. For sure. Um, and similar to Dogwood and, and Mitchell Lake, we rely on volunteers and that can be with habitat restoration, trail maintenance, visitor services at the front desk, helping with our education programs, your public programs, and then a variety of community naturalist uh, initiatives where we can community science programs you can assist with, like our Christmas bird count. Um, I'm the compiler for the circle here in South Dallas. So just reach out if you're interested in, in, in participating. We do point count surveys on site. Uh, so there's a lot of things for you to get involved with with your naturals community here in Dallas. And programs wise, every third Saturday of the month, we lead a guided bird walk. And it's fun because every walk, you never know what you're going to see, especially this time of year during migration. And it's either myself or some other bird nerds here on staff or volunteers. And we're just really excited to get out there and look for birds. Um, if you check out our website, you'll see there's a list of, of other programs and events that we offer throughout the year. Um, some fun things coming up in September. We have our swift night out. We'll be counting chimney swifts that are going to be um, congregating around our chimney swift tower, but also other birds that we might encounter like barn swallows or purple martins and maybe some other things passing through. Every second Sunday of the month, we have our science Sunday. That's more geared towards families where they can bring out their, their young naturalists, their little naturalists in the family who's really interested in science. 
And then every second Saturday is a guided nature hike. So there's something for everybody and all of it is listed on our website. Ugh, oh, I'm so excited. I'm learning so many things. Uh, Aaron, how about yourself? Could you answer that for us as well? Talking, we're talking about how we can, um, what are opportunities for people to connect with your center and then maybe some of your top events coming up? Yeah, so we have, um, just like everyone else, we rely heavily on volunteers. Um, volunteer opportunities everywhere from um, helping direct guests and orient them to the trails in the, in the visitor center to, um, working with education groups, which is my favorite. Um, and of course, the important habitat conservation work, um, whether it's removing invasives or helping us plant new plants in the fall um, in our native plant gardens or maintaining the trails. Um, we have a little bit of something for everybody if you're looking to volunteer and get involved. Um, we also do bird surveys. Um, so we do weekly bird surveys that you can help get involved with uh, to keep our eBird list up to date. Everything gets put into eBird, which helps people see what's being seen at the center, but it also um, it lets scientists view what's been seen uh, throughout the years. It's been going on for years, so we have that historical data. Um, same with we the Christmas bird counts, great backyard bird count in February. Um, lots of different bird counts to get involved with. Um, and we have a wonderful community of birders that's always willing to help you where you are. Um, when I started, I definitely, I've definitely learned a lot in my two years. Um, and it's because of the wonderful birders we have that are willing to help and teach and show you all the cool stuff. Um, if, uh, if you're looking for events, we have, um, Shorebird, like I mentioned, workshop coming up. We also, if you're not local um, or you're around the area and you just want to join on a webinar, we have um, nearly monthly webinars. This month is uh, fall planting with natives. And if you're not from San Antonio area, it's still great information. And we give resources on um, how to find natives in your area too. Um, there's also a lot of Audubon chapters around um, that are, if you look for your local Audubon chapter, birders are great, they'll, they'll probably be willing to direct you to some really cool bird walks or different ways to get involved. Yes, I love that you brought up chapters and I just put into the link, I'm um, in the chat, a link with, um, it has our, our Texas chapters and centers. So in that link, you can click it and see all three centers and go and find more information from everything that our lovely panelists are providing as well as to find your local chapter. Um, so there's a chapter uh, near all of our centers. Um, so you can go check what, out with that, what they're doing and how to get involved with them as well. I mean, they're always really good resources. I mean, Julie, I wanna circle back to you on these events and volunteers. We got a, we're kind of in a transition point. Um, so let's to hear more about Dogwood again. Thank, thank you. Uh, so some of our events that are coming up will be starting monthly bird walks in October, and those are open to people of all levels. We have great birders who love introducing people to birding, including birding by ear and using some of the apps that you can use like eBird uh, and Merlin. And um, so it's just a great way. You can borrow binoculars from us. We also do a first Saturday yoga, which seems maybe a little odd, but it's a great way to connect in our room and look out at the forest while you're doing yoga and then maybe go do a hike afterwards. Uh, but our big event that's coming up is our native plant sale. It's October 21st and we provide a wide variety of plants. We also do pre-sale online so you can just order online, make sure that you get the plants that you want and then just come and pick them up don't have to fight the crowds. Um, so those are our major events that are coming up. We also have an evening event on October 28th where we're going to have uh, ability to come out here in the evening to experience the center at night and listen to an author talk about Wild DFW, which all are both Trinity River and Dogwood Canyon are included in those books, in that book, uh, Exploring Nature Around the Dallas-Fort Worth Area. Oh, that's amazing. I'm talking about all these native plants. I'm really excited to go to a native plant sale at one of our centers and to make my little patio a beautiful space for that. 
Um, we have a vet to be able to hop back on on her phone. Um, so I'm going to pass off to her, uh, see if she has any more last minute thoughts to wrap up for our panelists. And then we have some of the great questions for our audience um, that we can circle into. Um, so a vet, um, I hand it back over to you. Thank you so much, Chloe. And apologies that my internet decided to go down right towards the end of our wonderful seminar. So I'm not going to turn my video back on just because I'm coming through uh, internet connection on my phone, and I don't want it to stress it out. I want to be able to be here with you folks until the end. So um, just to wrap up, um, I'm sure you folks talked about a lot of these things, and I just want to call out again the ability to tap into chapters if you're not local to any of our centers. Um, there is a question in our our Q&A box about Audubon centers in Austin. And so Austin is a wonderful city. There's lots of amazing work going on there. They just became a certified bird city this past winter. Um, in January, I believe we certified them. And there are many different centers that are owned and operated by Travis Audubon Society. And so that is a, a chapter. It's not part of the Audubon Texas state office like these other three centers are, but there are wonderful opportunities for you to go out into nature because of the Travis Audubon um, Society. So I highly encourage folks who are interested in, in the Austin area to reach out to Travis Audubon and check out their um, different sites. It's all listed on their website. And Chloe, can we drop the Travis Audubon website into the chat? I think that'd be helpful. So in addition to Audubon chapters, I know Chloe mentioned that, and we just talked about Austin a little bit. There's Texas Master Naturalist, and they have um, chapters all throughout the state. And those are going to be wonderful, engaged people who want to do the best for birds and insects and other types of mammals. They're passionate educators. They are great volunteers. And so if you are in West Texas, if you're in the very south part of Texas, if you're, you know, too far from Dallas centers or San Antonio center, check in with your master naturalists. They're wonderful people to reach out to. Um, the Native Plant Society, as you can tell, native plants are so important. And we've talked about that a lot today. Those are other passionate educators. So if you want to get your hands dirty, if you like uh, planting and you want to learn more, all of those folks are really wonderful to reach out to. Um, so that kind of wraps it up for me. I think there's lots of opportunities, even if you're not close to a center, to get engaged and do something for nature. Um, two of the questions that I see in the Q&A box is, um, I'm sorry, I don't want to mispronounce the name wrong, but I'm going to try. It looks like Rajesh. And so that person is asking, why does Audubon Centers require reserving a time to visit? And so I'm going to throw that out to Trinity first, and then other folks can pop in. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we started to do that to make sure we know how many people are on site each day, and it was just easier to um, have folks sign up that way. And even if you sign up for, let's say, 9 a.m., but you show up at 10, not a problem at all. It's just the system we use. That's how you can sign up so we can have a head count for how many folks are here each day. And we try to capture as much information as demographics as possible so we can remain free moving forward. So we can show that the visitation increase is still happening so we can hopefully remain free. Yeah, I think that's a really important aspect for um, all of our centers is to see what public is engaging there. And Mitchell Lake or Dogwood, is there anything that you want to add to that conversation of why we ask people to sign up? Sure. So signing up ahead of time just means that you don't have to sign in when you show up. You can just let us know that you're here and we'll check you off and then off you go on the trail. But capturing, we ask for signups, whether online or in person, walk-ups are certainly welcome. And it allows us, like Jake was saying, it captures those demographics and allows us to also report those numbers that are important for grants and other reports. So we have to capture a lot of these numbers to make sure that we are uh, keeping up with some of the requirements of the funding that we receive. Yeah, just one point. Just seconding for us that um, we we don't require the reservation. The times are there if you do reserve a spot online, but. If you come later, that's totally fine. Um, or if you just want to walk in um, and check in at the visitor center, that that works as well. We're open seven to one Tuesday to Thursday. I think I believe I said noon earlier. It's seven to one, and then seven to two Friday through Sunday. Excellent. And I just to clarify, you know, some of our uh, visitation hours are on the limited side. Part of that is help. You know, if you're at Mitchell Lake and you're trying to walk around a lot of those seven miles of trails in this Texas heat, 
heat stroke and heat exhaustion are real scary aspects. And so we, during the summer, we change our hours and may close a little bit early. Um, during the winter years, you know, we keep, sorry, not winter years, but the winter time during the year, uh, we keep some of our days kind of reserved for private events or um, public events that are happening for the center. So fundraising activities. Um, and then also somebody had asked about guided walks. And so all of our centers, that's an opportunity to reach out and do a birthday celebration. Uh, we have self-guided materials. And so all of that is on each center's website. I would highly encourage you to check that out. Okay, it looks like we have maybe one more um, question, which is, okay. Oh, okay, yeah, I was just gonna jump, yeah, jump on that um, idea. Um, I, there's, I saw another question pop up. Um, someone asked about if any of our Audubon centers are more accessible than others. They really love, you know, birdability initiatives and are just trying to make sure that um, they know how accessible spaces are and where they might be able to find that information. Anyone want to take it away? I feel that fully have an answer to that. Well, Dogwood Canyon, the building is accessible for sure. The trails, not so much. And that's something that we want to work on. I would love for our Canyon floor trail to be a, a boardwalk the entire way. Now that I, I've been in a wheelchair for about a year. And so I'm realizing some of the limitations of our, of our centers. And so I am probably going to be a big advocate to try to make our center more accessible for sure. So that's something we definitely want to work on. Yeah, and at track, we do have some trails that are um, ADA approved, and they're all either boardwalk or um, a combination of boardwalk trails and crushed gravel, and not all of them are ADA accessible there. At Mitchell Lake, a portion of our trails are crushed granite, and they're ADA compliant, um, and then we also have the driving trails, um, which are great to see everything just from your car. Uh, I just want to highlight that Anne did say that we have those driving trails at Mitchell Lake. And Joyce asked about not having cars but allowing bikes at Mitchell Lake. And Joyce, the reason that we are advocate for cars there, birds actually don't get as scared. If you someone bikes by, they tend to flush really easily. If a car is like creeping along, the birds don't freak out as much. It ends up working like a mobile bird blind. And so that's actually why we don't allow bikes at Mitchell Lake. I think there, it might change in the future, and Aaron, I don't know if you want to speak to that, but my understanding is that as the south part of San Antonio is developing more, there are more connecting bike trails, and so it's something that we're considering in the future. Aaron, did you have anything to say on top of that? Sure. Um, we, uh, with the city bond money um, that we just got, part of the allocation will be to connect a portion of the existing bike trails to the backside of, of uh, Mitchell Lake. So there will be a portion that connects um, that you're able to bike through, um, just not through the sensitive wetland areas so it doesn't affect birds. Fantastic, thank you so much. So we are getting close to the end of our time together and sharing about Audubon. Chloe mentioned earlier about a call to action and ways that each person on this uh, webinar can take to heart the learnings that we've talked about here, even if you're not close to a center. And so, Chloe, I want to um, throw it over to you to explain what our uh, social media challenge is. And if folks who are able to pop on camera want to show off some of the swag that Chloe's going to talk about in a moment, that would be wonderful. Uh, go ahead, <laughs> Chloe, take it away. Thanks so much, Yvette. Um, it's so great to talk to you all. We're having a lot of good conversations in the Q&A um, from our centers. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, I do also want to highlight and recognize, talk about this a little bit, but to, there's a, a question that has been answered um, in the chat asking a little bit about the difference between the Audubon um, centers versus the chapters and sanctuaries. Um, and just want to clarify that from the National Audubon, we have our state office, and from our state office, we have centers that are connected. And so these are all from the National, the National Audubon Society staff. And then from there are some of our chapters that are staffed. Some of them are volunteers on the grounds and others might be staffed. Um, but those chapters aren't necessarily, um, don't have National Audubon staff uh, immediate affiliates. They're their own 501c3 nonprofit. 
but we all do work from grass top to grass bottom, um, from grass roots rather, to help protect and work in bird conservation. So our centers are directly connected with our National Audubon Society as well as our state office. Um, so these are those three centers that are connected to that. Um, and who we talked about earlier across the US, there nationally we have 31 National Audubon centers um, and those are these specific spaces. Our, some of our chapters we put in the chat, as Yvette mentioned earlier, um, like Travis and Houston own property. They own sanctuaries you can also visit. They're a great birding location. Um, and our centers though provide um, great birding locations as well as a lot of other programming that we've mentioned. So hopefully that clarifies a little bit, but also please refer to the answer that was typed um, into the Q&A. And now for our rollout, drum roll of our uh, new um, conservation uh, initiative. So I'm gonna share my screen and show you, we are working on um, rolling out, it's our Audubon Texas Steward. So our hope for you after you've kind of gone through this today uh, is to take some time to think about how you can be an, your own Audubon Steward um, in your community. Um, we, you mentioned today, is it conserving water, planting native plants, um, picking up trash, um, what are some opportunities and ways that you can um, be a steward in your own community? And so I'm going to show you um, what that would uh, look like um, as an example. So our goal is that you can share this through social media um, and you can post something like this, something similar that says, what you're up to on maybe on Instagram and say that you're going for a bird walk and you picked up trash on your way. And with the way that we are able to track these is if you use a hashtag on social media, if you use the hashtag, the Audubon Texas steward and use that hashtag, we're able to then track and follow all these. We're going to keep count of these. We're going to reshare them on our social media accounts. You can do this on Instagram, you can do this on Facebook, um, show that maybe you were what we were doing with native plants. Um, you can also um, do it on Twitter, now known as X, if that is your social media platform. Um, but you must use that hashtag Audubon Texas Steward um, to really help us to track and follow this. Uh, but say you don't have a social media account, that's totally okay. You can email us. Uh, you can go to Audubon Texas at audubon.org, email us. Um, what your Audubon steward action is in. And this is gonna be for the month of September. So all through September, we're asking you to post what your Audubon steward, your Audubon conservation action is, um, whether you went to a, a center, whether you are looking at picking up trash, taking someone birding, um, what are ways you can get involved in your community. And so just post something on social media, really you gotta use that hashtag, hashtag Audubon Texas steward, and through that month, at the end of it, we're going to um, pick three winners, three folks that have participated through this and provide them with some uh, of our celebrating our 100 years centennial swag. Jake is wearing his hat right now. We have wonderful t-shirts. Um, so this is really showing that Audubon, thank you, Julie, has been here for 100 years in Texas doing the good work on the ground with our chapters, our centers, and our state office. So um, we're so glad to do that. And when we were talking about those caterpillar sausages, uh, I couldn't help myself, but I, I found this photo potentially of a golden cheek warbler. <laughs> and I thought it was really funny and I had to share it as well um, to kind of get us in the mood and excited about maybe you're on a bird walk and you saw this lovely, lovely bird with a good caterpillar and you know that someone's planting some native plants and there's good bugs and it's a good reminder. So uh, I'll stop sharing. Um, but we'll send a follow-up email and post, post it on our social media to remind folks to participate in our Audubon Texas Steward for this month of September. Uh, participating in that initiative really helps us to spread the awareness and message of how you can be a, a good um, bird-friendly Texan. So I think without further ado, um, that is the end of our webinar. Um, so let's give a big round of applause to our panelists um, and to our moderator for working through um, the difficulties of the internet and technology. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate everyone being on here. If you have more questions or thoughts, please feel free to um, email us at audubontexas um, at audubon.org and we'll put it in the chat and we can answer those. 
And we hope that you will change our 76% of folks that have not visited a Audubon Center in Texas connected to our National Audubon Association to go visit them this year. So that's our new goal. So next time we come back around next year to have this, another webinar, we'll see if that number changes. So thank you all so much for being here today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks to you folks. Have a great day. Bye all.